Yeah. Okay, so listen up. Uh, what we're going to do is take some notes. Um, this is on topic 3.8. Uh, we are going back in time to Napoleon. I know that we've already... Um, well, who here had... Um, yes. Jackson, don't talk. Who here had uh, Miss Tanner or Mr. Atwood last semester? Did any of you? Okay. I guess that you all need. So we didn't cover uh, Napoleon because we were focusing on our um, National History Day project. Uh, so we're going to focus on him now, but the reason we're doing that is because Napoleon is the first like legit nationalist, and you have to know about Napoleon in order to understand nationalism. So I want you to go ahead and at the top, you can write topic 3.8. The notes that you take today will help you a lot on the Monday quiz. You also can use these notes on your quiz. Um, you can also write this question down. What were the accomplishments of Napoleon? What ultimately led to his downfall? And tomorrow we'll get to what were the goals of the Congress of Vienna. This question here will appear on, uh, could appear on the test. It's one of the will. questions that might be on there. You said will. Could. No, you said well. That's okay. You said well before you said it. So you might recognize this song. Uh, this is the national anthem of France. It's called Le Marcel Lay. I'm saying it right? Le Marcel Lay. Uh, this is like the Star Spangled Banner for France. Okay. Uh, it was actually written during the French Revolution. And it's really a good example of nationalism in a very early stage. The song has lyrics that say things like, sacred love of the fatherland, lead, support our avenging arms. Liberty, cherish liberty. Fight with thy defenders. Under our flags, may victory. Hurry to thy manly accents, so that thy expiring enemies see thy triumph in our glory. To arm citizens. It's very patriotic very nationalistic, and uh, it's why we're going to be talking about Napoleon, okay? So does everybody have this question right now? You don't have to write it. No, 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 no. Topic 3.8, you said, what, what did Napoleon accomplish? What led to his downfall? What's Congress of Vienna? That's basically it, okay? Um, Okay, so uh, this image here is of Napoleon. Um, it is not really what he looks like. He looks way more godlike in this. This is during his battles in uh, northern Italy where he stormed the Alps. And they put him on a white stallion in this image. This is drawn by Jacques Louis de Vie. Uh, this is in the Louvre in Paris, the biggest museum in the world. Um, in reality, though, Napoleon rode on a donkey. Um, and which wouldn't be as exciting to paint. Uh, but Napoleon is really smart in the way that he uses the media to show the people what a great figure he is, and I'm going to get into that. I'm going to the next one. Don't write this timeline down, but I just want you to be aware of a lot of the events we've talked about with the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, and Napoleon all are taking place at the same time. You can see that the steam engine is powering textile machines a few years before the French Revolution starts. Okay? The Factory Act is passed not too long after Napoleon loses power in France. Uh, the Factory Act, you guys remember, uh, granted, uh, uh, created uh, regulations on child labor. Um, so in between, we have lots of things going on. You have Louis XVI gets guillotine. You have the reign of terror where 17,000 people, French people, die by guillotine under the Committee of Public Safety. Uh, uh, and you have the creation of the directory government to kind of reinstate order. So it's during all the, these events that Napoleon exists here. Now I want to go over this quickly. You don't have to write this down. But I want to talk a little bit about the old regime again. So. The old regime or the feudal system or absolutism. Uh, what's at the top of the pyramid? What controls everything? Uh, even above the king. God, or according to this, who? Is that he looks like it or that's an oak? But 
Yes, for all of you Bailey students, you get really excited about the old English D. But no, I, lie. that's gonna be on the bird. But anyway, this old system functions. It works, I guess, well for Europe during the time. But what we see is this challenging of this system. So basically, I've got at the top. Uh, how do you know about God? Like, who tells you about God? The king. Actually, the church. And, and where do you read about it? In the Bible, right? So everything that's true about how you should run a society or do anything, it has to be found in the Bible or the church has to approve it, okay? So uh, kings and queens act as like ambassadors for God in this system. Uh, they're supposed to be gods. Uh, there's a few Bible verses they use, like submit to the governing authorities of the world, or um, um, that's Romans 13. And then uh, uh, king's heart is, is guided by the hands of God. That's also another verse that's used. And so these kings and queens are acting on behalf of the supreme good. Okay? Uh, now, this whole system is shaken up by a philosophical movement. What is that movement called? The Enlightenment. The Enlightenment says, hey, like, do we really have to use the Bible uh, to justify all these things? What do they actually turn to instead of the Bible? Science. Did you say science? Yeah. Science. They replace God with, I know I told you money, like, earlier, but that's later. But they replace God with this idea of using science uh, to prove something. They're like, hey, we should base the best way to run a society off of what's scientifically proven, okay? So Napoleon is the person who replaces this system throughout Europe with a new modern system. And that's what we're gonna be talking about. So I want you to go ahead and put a Roman numeral, uh, Napoleon on the rise. There's gonna be three Roman numerals. Under each Roman numeral, there's going to be a lowercase letter that will be attached to that point, okay? So Napoleon Bonaparte is born on the island of Corsica, which is actually not technically France. It's actually more of a part of Italy, yeah? Should you be writing that down? Yeah, you should, write, well, you should just write down I. All bold stuff. If you want to write down other things, you can, but I'll, uh, what did you do? Can you click it? Here we go. Can you spell that? Uh, Korska, C-O-R-S-I-C-A. Yeah, I'll have bolded stuff that I really want to write down. If you want to do this in double space, uh, and then you can go read the book later and add, maybe interject some things, I really follow the book fairly closely in this PowerPoint. So Napoleon's born on Korska. It's not really France, but his dad makes a lot of money, enough money to send him to a military academy in France where his son can experience things that he never experienced. When Napoleon gets there, everybody makes fun of him and thinks that he's kind of a freak, actually. He be short. No, actually he wasn't short. I'll get to that in a little bit. I'm joking. But we all think he was short because I'll get to it. I'll break it down a little bit. Well, actually, I can break it down right now. Napoleon being short. So there's lots of weird propaganda created by the British that you still believe today. Like, for example, what did Columbus uh, figure out about the Earth? Um, that it's round. That's not real. That was made up. Mary was actually going to say the correct thing. But most students will say that Columbus discovered the Earth wasn't flat. And that's just British propaganda. I didn't know that. The other one is the point is short. Um, French inches are longer than British inches. So they sent his height, which was like, I think it's five foot seven or something, which is kind of short by today's standards, maybe. But back then, would have been average height. Um, your great-grandparents were probably like a foot shorter than you guys are. I can improve this with this board. This board was built in 1936, and if it was built for me, it should start here. This should be where I start writing. But instead, it was for somebody that was this tall, okay? So you can see it just even in this room. But anyway, Napoleon, the, the issue was that the inch systems weren't transferred, so they created this problem. like, oh, Napoleon's a short, he has short man syndrome, but he didn't. And Peabody and Sherman and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure still make Napoleon short. But anyway, the reason, yeah, the reason they don't like uh, Napoleon is because he speaks this like broken French. Uh, you know, it's like he has a southern accent kind of thing. So they make fun of him. So what he does, he just locks himself in his room and reads military strategy books and history books. He also suffers from some kind of condition 
where he didn't have to sleep the same amount of time as everybody else. So he could get away with like less than four hours of sleep a day. He would actually just nod off in the corner like this for like 15 minutes, enter into REM sleep somehow, and then wake up and just keep going. Thank you. Well, yeah, I'm actually not 100% sure. Like some people say it was intentional. Like he was on what's called the Da Vinci sleep cycle. Oh, I heard about that. Where you can, if you, you can train your brain so that you sleep less. Other people said it was something like insomnia. I don't know, you should look into it. But Napoleon gets there and, and, and he graduates this French Academy. He's, he's extremely intelligent. And when he gets out into the real world, it's the French Revolution. Now the cool part about the French Revolution is as the Joker says, there's room for aggressive expansion. Have you guys heard that? Yeah. Okay. Wait, which, which movie do we find? The good, the Dark Knight. Yeah, yeah. 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 So he, he, the, the idea is that during the French Revolution, yeah. During the French Revolution, you have this elimination of nobles having special privileges. Like, for example, if you were a noble, you were like related to Louis the Fourteenth or something. They'd be like, "You're the captain of the military," and you'd be like, "Well, that's great. I don't know anything about it, but because of my blood, I get into it, right?" So, uh, what happens with Napoleon and during the French Revolution is these nobles lose those privileges. Jackson, can you turn around? I know you, so you love touching Scotty. I, do I have to move Scotty? No. No. I'm Scotty, I'm moving you if Jackson touches you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to protect you. Um, but during the French Revolution, the idea of being a noble is very frowned upon, right? Like if you address somebody as sir or madam, you could actually get guillotined for doing it because that's the word used to address nobility. You have to call everybody citizen because you're all equal. You're all fellow citizens, right? right. Yeah. Wasn't there yeah, so well, there's like a bunch of French revolutions, but the late is French uh, revolution, I think is 1848. We'll talk about it actually next week. Yeah? Do you have a question, Frank? Well, yeah, I kind of, I don't know if it's Citizen, office, sir? What? Citizen, I don't know sir. if it's office or not, sure. but like Marines and like, like county. Yeah. yeah. What about it? I think you were gone when we did the French Revolution, but yeah, we talked about Marie Antoinette. She's kicking it, right? I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it here in just a second. We already did the French Revolution, but you were gone for a long time, so then you missed that. But anyway, Napoleon, then, the way you advance in the military is not because of your bloodline, it's because of your skills. And Napoleon's got the skills, so he goes quickly up through the military. He ends up getting famous because there's a bunch of royalists that want to support King Louis the 16th and Marie Antoinette, uh, and they end up uh, uh, wanting to, to bring back the king and queen and fight against the revolution. And Napoleon just shows up in the city on the streets with some artillery and mows them all down. And so he's like, oh yeah, Napoleon, you're saving the revolution from these people, right? But then we get to his other early military victories. Because of that, he sent to this campaign against Austria Austria does not want the French Revolution to happen because they don't want it to spread to their country because the kings want to keep their power. They're also upset that their daughter, Marie Antoinette, who is from Austria, had her head chopped off. So they're fighting this war against Austria. Napoleon's sent over there. They think he's going to lose uh, because he's given this ragtag military. Napoleon shows up and gives a speech. He's like, hey, Military, your government doesn't care about you, but I do, and I'm gonna lead you to victory. <laughs> so he gets to this, gets to Italy, Northern Italy to fight against Austria. Austria's taken over Northern Italy. By the way, Northern, Italy's not even a country at this point. But Napoleon gets there, he fights several battles, and he wins. Napoleon is an amazing general. Uh, He's it, probably the thing he's most famous for is he's probably one of the greatest generals in human history. He was known for his bold attacks and his quick attacks. What he would do is uh, he had large, uh, uh, so, a large group of soldiers, but they would move very quickly. Uh, one soldier said that it's not, uh, General Napoleon hasn't taught us to use our bayonets, he's taught us to use our legs. Um, he also was famous for getting down in the trenches with his soldiers because he was a good leader. He didn't just command them from afar, he actually got down and did it, right? 
So he would be right beside his soldiers helping him load the artillery to fire. This made him really famous among his soldiers. He's known for taking a, a medal off of his own coat and giving it to one of the best soldiers during a battle. He also didn't give awards based on nobility. He gave it based on their skill. So he really encouraged this idea of being very skillful, not just stepping into power because you're daddy or whatever. Right? <laughs> uh, he also would keep them well fed with bread and meat and give them lots of alcohol, which also made him very popular. And then he would also compensate them if they did well with money, which also incentivized them to fight for him. So he's very well loved by his men. Uh, while he's there in Italy, this is where I get this painting from, he ends up going through Italy and telling all the northern Italians, hey, you are Italians. You don't have to serve your king and queen. You all have rights like life, liberty, and property. You all should have the right to vote. And so he spreads the ideas of the French Revolution through Europe, which is why he's called the Revolution on Horseback. He undoes all the old regime, that feudal system, through northern Italy. He returns back to France to a bunch of parades, and he gets a new mission, which is to go to Egypt, which is really random, because why would you go to Egypt during the French Revolution? The reason being is that Britain is a thorn in France's side, but France can't fight directly against Britain. Why not? Why can't you fight directly against Britain? They're an, island. They're an island. They have a huge moat. They have the strongest navy in the world. You don't want to mess with them. But France has this idea, let's go to Egypt, which is a colony of Britain, and we will sabotage their economy down there and get the Egyptians to follow France. So Napoleon sent down there on a mission, um, and before, say during the old regime, during the feudal system, if you were going to go down to northern Africa or the Middle East, it's probably because you're on a crusade. You're trying to spread Christianity to those infidels, the Muslims down in the Middle East, right? But Napoleon doesn't have any of that Christian uh, idea. In fact, he actually creates pamphlets saying that he loves Islam, he loves the Prophet Muhammad, and that a lot of people in France are Muslim, which wasn't even true, but he just tries to trick them into liking him. But when he gets down there, what he does, he's not a missionary for Christianity, He's a missionary for the Enlightenment. He sets up schools in Egypt, and he brings with him scientists, like people with butterfly nets, so they can catch insects in Egypt and study them and put them in their encyclopedias or fish, get some fish out of the Nile. And he brings with him some archaeologists, like Jean-Francois Champollion, to dig up old rocks, because that's important. In fact, it's so important that he finds this rock called the Rosetta Stone, the Rosetta Stone is text, the same text written three times in three different languages. The top text is Kony Greek, which is like emoji texting Greek, it's like common Greek. The second one is like fancy Greek, like how uh, Mr. Bailey speaks English. <laughs> and the third one is uh, Egyptian, and it's the same thing written three times. So they're able for the first time in human history, well since Egypt, to interpret what Egypt, the Egyptians were saying. Before that, you'd go into a pyramid, you'd see a bunch of things on the wall, you're like, I have no idea what that says. Mm -hmm. Now it's unlocked, and all of a sudden you can create this whole new study called Egyptology, which leads to your seventh grade class, World History One, where you talk about Egypt and the Nile and all that stuff. And you know King Tut and pharaohs and things like wow. that. And that's all because of Napoleon. But on the military side, he fails epically. He loses almost every battle he fights, but what he does, he plays this up, and he returns back to France, and he doesn't talk about his losses. He actually abandons his army in Egypt, but nobody knows about it in France. He's like, oh yeah, it's very successful, okay? When he arrives back, sorry, Josephine. when he arrives back in, Fran uh, in France, it's a huge deal. I cannot stress enough the celebrity of Napoleon. We have no equivalent. If you look at our presidents, We've had lots of generals that have become president, like General Washington, General Jackson, Andrew Jackson, Ulysses S. Grant, Teddy Roosevelt, Dwight Eisenhower. The last military one, what, four? General Sherman? Is that not? 
shopping in general? No. Maybe not a lot of general. General force. <laughs> uh, the last, I think the last military, the last serious military president, I'll say, is George H.W. Bush. So we don't have equivalent, but you can think of it as like Michael Jordan coming to Moscow, okay? Like if Michael Jordan was walking down Main Street of Moscow, and a student came to my room and was like, Michael Jordan's on Main Street, I would be like, school's out, let's go. <laughs> I would seriously drop, I'd be like, I feel sick, or whatever I have to do to get out of it, to go meet Michael Jordan, because that'd be a huge event. Like that's, that's a historical event, this is world history, I think that's important to meet Michael Jordan, <laughs> the greatest basketball player ever lived. The same thing was Napoleon. Okay, Napoleon shows up in France, they had plays going on, and this guy just comes out on stage like, shut up with the play, listen everyone, Napoleon's here. And they're like, Napoleon? And they all like leave the theater, and they throw a parade for when Napoleon gets back, okay? So, Napoleon arrives, this dude comes up to him, he says, we, he, he wants to throw a coup over the government. I'm gonna skip this just a bit here. Dang it. Um, you have, the government of France has been very volatile. If you think of uh, how many governments has America had in 250 years? No, I mean, how many is the United States government? How many United States governments have there been? One. One. France, in 10 years during the French Revolution, goes through four different governments. Okay? So they have the National Assembly. There's like a, these two are a limited monarchy. They're fine. Once you get here, a bunch of people get their head chopped off. When you get here, after Maximilian Robespierre is killed, you have this like pretty stable government, but nobody's really happy with it. For the liberal people, it's not liberal enough. They're like, we need more rights. For the conservative people, like, we want a king back. So it's all dysfunctional. So when Napoleon gets back, he's like, I'm gonna throw a coup d'etat, which sounds like a fun party, but it's basically a military takeover of the government. He shows up with 7,000 troops. He walks into the legislative assembly or the, uh, the directory, he says, I'm taking this over, okay? <laughs> um, he actually, when he walks in, he thinks everybody's just gonna be like, oh, Napoleon, you should be the leader. Thank goodness you're here. But instead, a bunch of people call him a tyrant. And they say, oh, this guy's a dictator. We can't let him take our government. And one guy grabs him by the neck, and it makes them all fumble, and like he loses his words, he doesn't know what to say. And actually, they're about to turn on him when his brother takes out his sword and he puts it to Napoleon's chest and he says, if Napoleon's a tyrant and take, wants to take our liberty, I'll kill him. And also everybody backs off because of that for whatever reason. Uh, the very liberal people get freaked out uh, by the military presence and they escape, uh, they leave, and Napoleon proclaims himself the first consul. Consul is, first consul is a title used by Julius Caesar and be of a Roman emperor. And Napoleon basically consult, creates a new government, a fifth government, and calls himself the first consul. There's a second and third consul that have no power, and a whole senate that has no power either. He basically centralizes power to himself. Now you think the French people, after fighting for human rights for the last 10 years, would be like, oh, this is terrible, we have king again. It's just like Louis. But actually, the French people support his takeover. They're like, yes, we have Napoleon. Uh, he has these votes called the plebiscite, and he has these votes where he checks the, the pulse of the population to see what they think of him, and they unanimously agree that Napoleon is awesome, okay? Um, they actually, in the first election, his brother tries to sabotage it and give him some extra votes. That doesn't happen. Uh, <laughs> sarcasm. I don't know if it's sarcasm, actually, to be honest with you. But uh, he, his brother tries to add some extra votes, but he finds when he's trying to sabotage his election that he doesn't even need to because the French people love Napoleon so much. He's like, oh, wow, they really want a fascist dictator, I guess. Weird. So Napoleon takes over. He has a few more of these plebiscites where they get to vote, and they love him so much. He's like, well, you know what? I'm going to up my ante here. I know you guys had a king before, but how do we go past the king? And the way you do it is you become an emperor. So he has this huge ceremony, invites the Pope there. He's like, the Pope's gonna come. The Pope thinks like, oh sweet, I get to put a crown on Napoleon. He's this famous war hero, it's gonna be sweet. But what happens is that Napoleon here, let's zoom in. That painting, by the way, is in the Louvre. It's like, it's bigger than this whole wall. It's massive. I didn't get to see it because stupid COVID sent me home before I got to go see the Louvre. Biggest museum in the world. 
has like Mona Lisa's there. Mona Lisa is in the Louvre in France because Napoleon stole it. And then, like, kind of doesn't it get like stolen like every year? The, the Mona Lisa is actually, I hate to break to you guys, it's not that great of a painting. The reason it's so famous is because it was stolen in the early 1900s, and the heist of the Mona Lisa made it a famous painting. There's also like a line on the floor of people like going around the Mona Lisa to watch it, her as you like. Watches you? Like, yeah. And it's really weird because if you look at the ground, there's like worn out like. Dimes. See you with her? Yeah. With blue? So yeah. You saw you saw Venus and Milo. Did you see this painting? Probably. I was. It's like pretty big. Nine. Did you? Oh. Yeah. I really only remember the. This is pretty movie. high level. Yeah, you definitely remember. Did you remember the Venus and Milo, the no arm statue? Yes, I did. Did you see Hammurabi's code? Big rock. I did not. Was or not. not. I probably just thought it was some rock. Did you see Sphinxes? <laughs> No. All the, there's a bunch of sphinxes in the Louvre. That's also because of uh, the plans the Egyptian campaign. So anyway, he comes in. The, the Pope, which is sitting here, is like, okay, I'm going to put this crown on. But Napoleon does something very modern and very enlightenment. Instead of the Pope putting the crown on Napoleon's head, which shows that God is giving, the Pope is a representative of God, God giving the authority to Napoleon, Napoleon takes the crown and he puts it on his own head, showing that he didn't need God to do it, he got there himself. This is a very modern, enlightenment thing to do, okay? Who's the girl? The girl is Josephine. I know I, I probably should Josephine? Josephine is, is Napoleon's wife. Uh, Josephine was very was older than Napoleon, and she was getting too old, and she couldn't find a proper suitor. But she needed to latch herself to someone who was going to be, get a lot of money and be really famous and high in society. And Napoleon was obsessed with her, like creepily. You should read the letters, they're creepy. <laughs> um, Wait, like what level of creep? <laughs> like, like he just constantly talking about, she's like, he's like, you're the most of me, you're an angel, blah, 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 yeah, whatever. But, and then, uh, so Napoleon, uh, she ends up marrying Napoleon, even though she really doesn't like him that much, especially initially. Just because she's like, this is kind of my last thing. I'm getting pretty old. I gotta latch onto this dude so I can sail into the upper class, right? Okay, so this brings us to two. Napoleon is now the Emperor of France. That's a picture of him. You can see on the right side here, you have a corset. This is a symbol of religious authority on this side and his right hand. He has a scepter showing that he is the leader of the state. On his head, he doesn't have a crown. He is beyond crown. France gave up a king and got an emperor, right? Somebody who's even more tyrannical. Uh, he puts this uh, uh, crown on his head that's very much like a Roman emperor. Napoleon literally thinks he's bringing the Roman Empire back. And just as a refresher, the Roman Empire is the last time that all of, Ro all of Europe was taken over by one governing authority. Okay? So... Napoleon decides to reestablish the Roman Empire. So he has to take over all of Europe. <laughs> That's his plan. How he does this is through warfare. He has the Napoleonic Wars. From 1804 to 1812, Napoleon battled the combined forces of the greatest European powers. You'd think that Napoleon, as an emperor, would mean that he has, uh, he's just going to sit in his throne room and just kick it, right? But no, Napoleon, a good leader, has to be down in the trenches with his people. If he's not, nobody will listen to them. Okay? Nobody will support them or respect them. So Napoleon is typically on horseback with his soldiers, and he's sweeping through Europe with victory after victory because of his superior military strategy. Even battles that looked like he was definitely going to lose, he had less people, he would win. Um, Napoleon believed that Josephine, as long as he loved Josephine, she was his star, and that she would grant victory to him just by his love for her, which again goes back to this weird and creepy thing. Uh, but it's weird because once he divorces Josephine, he starts losing battles all the time. So I don't know. Maybe there's something. Say that again. Oh, dude, you got Ninja Turtle back in. Sorry, that's on video. Wait, what? He, uh, he actually, so he thought she was cheating on him, and he was actually cheating on her, and they just decide to amicably leave each other. Right, right, right. One of those situations. Um, so with these Napoleonic, oh, sorry, go ahead. 
No, these, like I said, these paintings, they romanticize Napoleon. It's like propaganda. Like, look how awesome Napoleon is, everybody. So he didn't have, like, a favorite? I'm actually not sure if he had, like, a specific horse. I'm sure he did. Usually, like, if you're in the military, you usually have some kind of bond with a horse. I just don't know. You should look it up. Actually. Yeah? So you said he rode a donkey. Did they all ride donkeys? No. What? I feel like I should look that up. <laughs> I, I don't, okay. I actually don't think it was a donkey. I think it was a, uh, what's the thing that's a half horse, half donkey? Mule. 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 But I can't remember why exactly. But I know it was not a white stallion. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So anyway. This is what Europe looks like before Napoleon. You can see all the separate countries and such. Little side note, um, Italy is not technically a country. And also the Holy Roman Empire, which isn't holy, isn't Roman, it isn't an empire. Uh, what country is there today, actually? Germany. Germany. At this point, it's actually 400 different states. Uh, but remember, state, our definition over here, population, territory, government, and sovereignty. There, was some, there were some states that were literally cities smaller than Moscow that had their own constitutions, their own sovereignty. It'd be like if Moscow had its own military and could go to war with Poland, okay? So there's 400 different states here. Now, Napoleon takes over the whole thing. So through his superior military strategy, he annexes, this is a vocab word, incorporates into your empire. Be like if, if, if Idaho took over Oregon, we would annex Oregon. Um, he extends the French Empire, which you can see in this dark uh, green. He also, though, has control over this light green here. Now, when he takes over the Holy Roman Empire, he says 400 different states is too hard for me to control. I'm going to drop it down to 38. He consolidates it down to 38. This will set the stage for later. Germany will take those 38. They're all German people, part of the German nation. They all speak German. Like, look, why not just make one state? And that will lead to Germany. We'll talk about next week. Um, as Napoleon takes over these places, he's destroying the feudal system. He's getting rid of the feudal system and installing very modern republics where people have equal voting rights and people have rights like life, liberty, and property and all these things. So he basically is modernizing all of Europe as he goes through Europe. That's why it's called the Revolution on Horseback. Where's my here? Oh. Uh, this purple, those are allies. So those are his friends, okay? The only country he's fighting with here is Great Britain. That's it. Um, and as long as Great Britain stays on their side of the English Channel, things will be fine. So as he goes, he is basically giving all the leads. He's installing his brothers and his family members and uh, his friends in all the positions of authority. He goes into the Netherlands. I saw the place where he put his brother on the throne in the Netherlands to control it. Uh, but he also creates this law book called the Napoleonic Code. It's a book about this thick. And basically, these are the laws that all those places have to follow. Um, if you look at the, this is a cover of the book, actually. It's written in French, but it says, unite uh, into an indivisible republic with liberty, equality, fraternity, or face death. <laughs> um, so Napoleon, despite being a dictator, is taking these ideas of like liberty and making it like a slogan. It's like make America great again, except it's liberty, equality, and fraternity, right? Now, by liberty, he means human rights for everybody. By equality, he means equal justice for all, regardless of who your family members are, if you're a noble or a peasant. And by fraternity, this is the nationalism part. He's saying your brother's brother, means brotherhood, like a fraternity, you know, like you by. Uh, a fraternity is a brotherhood, meaning that your brotherhood is your country. It's not about being allegiant to a king, it's about being allegiant to Spain or Germany, or Italy. And he's spreading that idea throughout Europe, which sets the stage for nationalism. Whoops, there we go. Uh, you don't have to write this part down, but you probably do want to write this bolded business. So the influence here is that he spreads these ideas of equality, freedom of speech, freedom of press, practice whatever religion you want, all these Enlightenment ideas uh, to all of Europe, and actually beyond. 
Napoleon even influences Argentina, Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, Haiti. Uh, he even influences America uh, with Louisiana. Uh, Louisiana was a French territory, and it was huge. Um, Louisiana used to be this whole middle territory here. He takes it back over for Spain, uh, from Spain, and he actually sells it to Thomas Jefferson uh, for one of the biggest land acquisitions in American history. Uh, he sells it to Thomas Jefferson. He uses the money to fight wars in Europe. So very quickly. Um, <laughs> By now, yeah, I can't. He sold it for like nothing. I can't remember. Yeah, I know. It's like a, it's like like five cents an like acre or something. Yeah, it was like five cents an acre. Yeah, it's something it's barely anything. So the fall of Napoleon. So Napoleon has taken over all of Europe. So how the heck does he fail? Why doesn't he stay in power? By the way, like you have like taking over Europe is pretty big deal. <laughs> Come up front, that. It doesn't happen often. Uh, he hadn't created that. There had been that kind of consolidation since the Roman Empire. It's a very big deal. Uh, we'll see this again in the next century when Hitler takes over most of Europe as well. And they both do the same things wrong. Uh, the first thing, if you ever become the emperor of Europe, uh, you want to make sure not to mess with Britain. So this is British propaganda. You see Napoleon is very short in this. They're carving up the world for each of them. Uh, Napoleon knows not to fight Britain, so he creates the continental system, which means all of European countries cannot trade with Britain. Right? Uh, they can't trade with Britain, uh, but it ends up not working because Britain just trades with the United States and the Americas. Uh, this ultimately leads to the War of 1812, where Britain burns down the White House, but it's very time not to go into that right now. The other way that he fails is because of Spain. There's only two more things to go here. Spain ends up resisting the foreign rule of these foreigner French people. And again, we see this word foreigner, creates this us versus them dynamic. Uh, the Spanish people, because of Napoleon, end up nationalizing, uh, really loving the Spanish people and developing this love for, the, for their people uh, because they're in opposition to the French. Even though Napoleon has the, one of the greatest militaries ever raised in, uh, up to that point in Europe, the Spanish know they're going to lose, so what they do is they fight with guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla warfare is hit and run raids, specifically used by the Spanish against the French. Um, I like to think of this as when I was a kid, I was really fat. I was a huge fat kid. Um, I was probably like way as much as Tim, like in the fourth grade. Uh, but there's this kid named Kevin Splestozer, and he was really small. I used to bully him all the time because I was a terrible person. But Kevin Splestozer was really small and really fast. So what he'd do to get back at me is I wouldn't be paying attention. He'd run and jump on my neck and he'd put me in a sleeper hold or like pinch me or do weird stuff. But, and then he would run away and I would turn around and by the time, like it took me a long time to turn around. By the time I'd turn around, he was already like way far in the distance. And so then I'd start trying to run, not actually running, but trying and trying to catch Kevin's Blessdozer. But he was too fast and I'd get winded and tired and I'd just sit there hunched over and just cry to myself and go ahead and just swear curses at Kevin's Blessdozer for harassing me. Sorry, I should probably tell this to my counselor. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but, but basically, this is the same thing as Spain and France. France is a big fat army, like young Mr. Dale Bow, and this is Kevin's Blessdozer. Okay, so uh, they're able to attack, run away. And this is a way just to harass this big bully called France. Okay. The last one here is Napoleon's invasion of Russia. You never screwed Russia. No, if you ever become the emperor of uh, Europe, never invade Russia, especially in the winter. But what happens is Napoleon's... Wait, you did the same thing as Hitler? Same yeah. Hitler, seriously, 100 years later, all, his, all Hitler had to do is read about Napoleon and be like, oh, don't attack Russia. Russia yes. He did it at the middle. So Napoleon told all these European countries, hey, don't trade with Britain. We're trying to cut off money. That's the way we'll defeat them is by cutting their money supply off. But Russia, under Alexander, uh, Tsar Alexander, ends up trading with him. Just a side note, they say that Napoleon and Alexander uh, were in love with each other. And you can find a woodcut of them kissing on the lips. So anyway, he felt very betrayed. He's like, that's it. And he 
takes 600,000 soldiers, the largest military ever raised up to that time in US in world history, people from 20 different nations around Europe, Germans, Italians, Spanish, French, all marching together with 50,000 horses into Russia, looking for a battle, okay? Uh, just to put this in context, this is one army, the Grand Army. 600,000 soldiers was how many soldiers Rome had at its peak in all of its armies put together. This is a huge amount of people. They end up going into Russia, but what happens is they can never get that battle they're looking for because the Russians just basically burn down their city and run away. Now they keep burning down these cities, and this means the 600,000 people can't get any food, they can't get any resources, which Napoleon would often do, just take stuff from around them. So they end up getting hungry, and finally they get to, to Moscow. This is the city, the big city that they're looking for here. To fight, and they have a fight, and they win. But once they win, they look around, they see Moscow is on fire, not our Moscow, but Moscow, Russia, uh, and that there's no food, and Napoleon realizes he doesn't have enough supplies, so he has to retreat back. Now, during this retreat, um, basically have 600,000 people uh, march in. Out of During this retreat, winter happens, Russian winter happens. One general said that it wasn't Russian bullets that de defeated Napoleon, it was general winter and general famine. Famine being that there's no food. When he was marching back, uh, 200,000 soldiers die. <laughs> 200,000 soldiers flee, and 200,000 soldiers make it back, okay? Um, during this time, they're freezing, there's no food. There's a story, and I don't know if it's true, but I'm gonna tell it just because it illustrates the point, is that on their way back, they were so cold that they would chop the hindquarters off, like a piece of the hindquarters off of a horse, and the horse was so frostbitten that it couldn't feel it, and they would eat it. Yeah, it's weird. There's kind of a picture of them just freezing out in the Russian winter. So Napoleon gets back. He's like, man, I screwed that up really bad. <laughs> uh, he takes some cyanide, unfortunately, or fortunately, the cyanide was expired. So he tries to kill himself, cyanide's expired. This happens all the time in history, by the way. So he abdicates the throne, he gives it up. They put him on this island called Elba, and he sits there all depressed for a few years. But then he starts like rebuilding Elba. Like he finds Elba's very inefficiently run. He becomes very charismatic. The people love him. He makes a government function. And finally they help him take a, a boat back to France. This is Elba right there. He takes his boat back to France. France is run by Louis the 18th. Louis the 18th is so morbidly obese that he has to ride around in a wheelchair. Uh, he is not a popular king at all. And so Napoleon shows up on the beach side and he comes off the boat, all of Louis XVIII's military is aiming guns at Napoleon. And he walks off the boat, Napoleon walks off the boat, takes his coat off and he's like, go ahead and fire upon your emperor. And all the soldiers drop their guns and they say, long live Napoleon. And they swear allegiance to him. And he takes over France again, which is ridiculous. <clears throat> and he becomes emperor of France for a hundred days until he fights this battle called the Battle of Waterloo, and this is Napoleon's famous where he lost. He fights against Britain, the Duke of Wellington. It's a one-day battle. At this point, he has divorced Josephine, his star, and maybe because of some weird supernatural thing, he ends up losing this battle. Uh, he sends his Imperial Guard down, and they are just squashed and destroyed, and Napoleon is very broken indeed. So the European powers say, we gotta get rid of this guy. We gotta make sure he's gone for good because he keeps coming back and screwing stuff up in Europe. So they send him to this island called St. Helena, literally in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, six mile wide island. Napoleon sits there, he writes books about how awesome he is. He sends him back to France. So we have to learn about it in history class. And then he dies of syphilis. That's that's the end of Napoleon. Do you still have syphilis? Syphilis is a, uh, well, it's a sexually transmitted disease that makes you go insane. Yep. Uh, lots of Europe, and actually, so Europeans sent smallpox over to the New Worlds. Uh, they say, all this debated, syphilis came back the other way. Uh, I don't know why. Um, 
But yeah, yeah, King George the Third had syphilis. All kinds of people had syphilis. Yes, Donkey Kong. No, um, you saw the funny picture of Napoleon. Which one? The one where he has his hand down his pants, or it's like I never showed that. Yeah, That's on video. Oh, I did not.